We will now pass on to a survey of the study of society in general. Any discussion on the pre-modern traditional society of the subcontinent has to begin with an understanding of the institution of Varna. The society in traditional India is ideally sought to be divided into strict four Varnas, Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas and Shudras. If we pick up the normative treatises like the Manusamhita, the Yajnavalka Smriti, the Anushasana and Shantiparvan of the Mahabharata, one cannot miss the strong insistence on the maintenance of this very strict fourfold Varna order. The plank of Swavarna marriage, that is marriage within the same Varna and the repudiation of inter Varna marriage, though very strongly stated in the normative texts, in fact has a different reading in the sources of our period. Though the ideal is marriage within the same Varna, the theoreticians allowed inter Varna marriage. The intermarriages between unequal Varnas led to what is called the intermixture of Varnas, Varna Sankara. That resulted in the form of mixed unions, mixed jatis, Mishra jati, the offspring of the unions between two unequal Varnas would lead to a new kind of a social designation. Now the Jati and the term Varna are two different institutions closely interlinked and translated by the same English word caste. But there is a fundamental difference. While the number of the Varnas are absolutely fixed, four, Manu declares there are only four Varnas in the society and no fifth Varna exists. Yet, the innumerable permutations and combinations in terms of intermarriages between unequal Varnas could lead to the emergence of numerous Jatis. Let us take one example. This is Onuloma marriage because it is taking place between a higher Varna male and a lower Varna female. The opposite is severely reprobated. The worst form of Pratiloma marriage according to the strict uh, Shastric norms. the worst in the Varnajati structure. Now the combination can be in terms of this peculiar system of intermarriage literally innumerable. So the Jatis have no fixed number while the Varnas are fixed in number. This is to be kept in mind. Now though the Jatis technically are different from Varnas, they are not synonymous. 
yet all the jatis ultimately are born out of some kind of permutation combinations among the four original varnas. Perhaps in this way Manu could verify and justify his statement that only four varnas exist, there is no fifth varna. The Brahmanas definitely enjoyed the highest social prestige in the Brahmanical social norms, yet there can be some difference between the ritual status of the Brahmana and the actual status of the Brahmana. If we take a look at the Mahabharata story of Dronacharya, who was indeed a Brahmana, but he pursued a profession which is typically non-Brahmana, he was giving instructions in martial skills, Dhanurvidya, archery, which normally is not associated with the profession of a true Brahmana. We also remember how Dronacharya in the story of the Mahabharata was banished, thrown out by the king of Panchala. On the other hand, if we once again look at the Mahabharata story of a very poor Brahmana family in the Ekachakra village. One finds that not all the Brahmanas enjoyed the prestige and status of the royal chaplain Purohita or the family priest Kuloguru as one sees in the case of say Vishwamitra in Ramayana. So there are different types of Brahmanas. And not all the Brahmanas enjoyed the very high prestige, at least the material comforts in life. And that is clearly visible if we compare the norms in the Shastras and the descriptions of some of the Brahmanas in the popular stories, particularly that in the epic. Of course, with the two epics, Mahabharata and the Ramayana, we find how the life of the Kshatriya heroes were, were growing up. There were of course large number of Vaishyas engaged in agriculture, crafts and trade and then the Shudras. Now where do we place the so-called mixed Jatis and what is actually their social position? Now the theory of mixed unions among unequal Varnas leading to Varna Sankara, admixture of Varnas is possibly only a theoretical statement. Many occupational groups tended to follow the typical Varna norms. We have spoken about many such occupational groups who insisted on hereditary profession, who had a very clear consciousness of rank. So they too followed certain kinds of caste-like rules and developed caste-like appearance. Yet one cannot technically increase the number of Varnas from 4 to 5. So the acceptance of these social groups occupational groups into the Jati structure, innumerable Jatis could be explained by this Brahmanical theory of the intermarriage among unequal Varnas and the rise of mixed Jatis out of the mixed union. Similarly, the period we have already indicated in our survey of political history and also history of trade brought in many non-indigenous ethnic groups, the Greeks, the Shakas, the Kushanas, the Parthians. Now they were being accommodated within the Indian society and many of them either were political elites or economically quite prosperous because of the trade, because of craft uh, activities. Now they too needed a social 
position, a recognition of the social position. Interestingly, many of such non-indigenous group were given the label Yavanas, a broad umbrella term, Yavanas. Sometimes they were called Mletchas, impure outsiders, yet some of the Yavanas would later be considered as non-exiled Shudras, that is for the first time they are given the status of Shudras, though the lowest of the fourfold Varna system, yet now the Yavanas are given the position within the Varna fold. Then later the Yavanas, materially prosperous and politically often powerful, had to be accommodated and given a proper status and therefore they were given the position of Vratya Kshatriyas, meaning they were downgraded Kshatriyas. Now from Shudras they are upgraded to the position of the Kshatriyas. In fact, they were in a degraded position according to the Shastras by not observing the typical rules of the Kshatriya Varna. But now they are considered at least a fallen Kshatriyas. This is how the society instead of being compartmentalized into strict frozen fourfold Varna norms shows some kind of movements, possibilities of mobility. As Ramila Thapar indicated that there was some possibility of occupational, spatial and social mobility particularly in the upper sections of the society. Interestingly, the entire Indian norms of Shastras suggests that the society ideally should be patriarchal and patrilineal. That is, it is essentially the family life is to be controlled, guided, managed by the eldest male member in the family, usually the father, and the descent is counted from the father to the offspring. Yet, in the same time, if we look at the peninsular part, the Satavahanas and many other areas in India were acquainted with the system of counting descent from mother side. That is why we come across the name like Gautami Putra, Vashishti Putra, obviously named after their mother Gautami or Vashishti. Let us take one specific case. In early first century, uh, late first century AD, in and around Nasik, an inscription records that there was a Brahmana whose name is Varahi Putra Ashvibhuti. Obviously, the first part of the name Varahi Putra comes out of the name of his mother Varahi. He is definitely a Brahmana in the Deccan, he is named after his mother, yet he had some land which he inherited from his father. It is a peculiar social position, condition, a society in transition where typically of the Deccanist system, the descent is counted from mother's side, yet inheritance is from the father to son. Now, it shows how complex and uh, complex was the society and yet the society was much more fluid than the strict Varna norms. In this case, we also find many of the so crafts group emphasized on hereditary profession like the term Kamara, meaning a blacksmith is the same synonymous with the term Kamara Putta, literally meaning the son, Putra or Putta of a Kamara or Karmakara. Similarly, the Settis about whom we have spoken, because of their great wealth and their access to corridors of power, the Settis are very conscious of their high social status and therefore we come across the term in the Jataka stories as Setti Kula, the group of Settis who married within their own fold, obviously they maintained a consciousness of rank and possibly uh, kept dining habits only to their own groups. What is very significant 
is that in spite of the major thrust on the maintenance of the fourfold Vardhana society and the uh, explanation of the emergence of jatis, no donative records give us the name of any Varna or any Jati about the donor. There are so many donative records in the Northwest, in Mathura, in Sanchi, Bharut, in Madhya Pradesh, in various places in the Deccan. Yet the donor, except when he is not a Brahmana, never utters his Varna or Jati affiliation, the donor merely mentions the occupation. So occupation is the marker of social status no less than the concept of birth which is strongly emphasized in the Brahmanical text. Now let us look also at the other plank of the Jati Varna society that is the institution of marriage. Now marriage is not only a determinant of one's social status, Varna status and Jati status, but marriage is integrally linked up with the position of women. In the typical patriarchal, patrilineal society, there is an inbuilt, inherent emphasis on the male members of the society and obviously a downgrading of the position of the women. That is why in the typical traditional Indian family life, Kula, the birth of a son is always preferred to the birth of a daughter. By this time, the very birth of a daughter is considered to have been bringing ill luck. Krichamtra Duhita, this, the daughter is a source of misery. There, the strict code of conduct in the laid down in the Shastras leaves little room for any formal education or any vocational training for the unmarried girl, especially in the families of the two upper varnas. There is a very clear tendency in the text of the Dharma Shastras of Manu and Yajnavalka to increasingly lower down the age of marriage of girls. There is a distinct preference for child marriage of the girl. According to Monu, if the bridegroom is 21 years of age, the girl should be 7. If the bridegroom is 30, then the bride should be only 10 years. Yet, let us look at the well-known stories in the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. The description of Draupadi and Sita at the time of their Swayambara form of marriage hardly indicates that they were less mature premature women, they were fully grown up women. So there is once again a clear divergence between the prescriptive normative texts and the descriptive accounts in many of the texts about the marriage of girls and the age of marriage of girls. In the married life, the wife according to the Dharma Shastra norms should be ideally completely devoted to the husband, even succumbing to the physical demands of the husband at any time. The unquestioned loyalty expected of a devoted wife, Apatibrata, is one such ideal. Yet, let us look at the scenery once again in the epics. We find how Gandhari on several occasions severely scolded Dhritarashtra for being lenient to their sons, the Kauravas. We also remember how Shakuntala, not the Shakuntala of Kalidasa's drama, but Shakuntala in the Mahabharata episode openly challenges Dushyanta when he refuses to recognize his wife. In the same manner, we find the argumentation 
of Draupadi on very fine legal matters and arguing openly with Yudhishthira. That there is also a discrepancy in the account of the traditional form types of marriage. For the first time, the Manu Samhita clearly lays down eight forms of marriage. The first four actually relate to the traditional Indian form of marriage where the father of the bride hands over the bejeweled bride to the bridegroom amidst the chanting of Vedic mantras. This is in fact an act of transfer of the girl almost like a commodity from one male guardian to another male guardian. These are considered by the Dharma Shastrakaras as the righteous marriage, Dharmya Vivaha. The other four does not require parental approval or parental intervention like Gandharva, which is marriage by consent, marriage by courtship. The typical case of marriage by courtship once again is the marriage of Shakuntala with Dushyanta that took place in the ashrama of Rishi Kanno. Similarly, when Arjuna abducts Subhadra and Marihar, that is the case of marriage by capture, Rakshasha, which hardly required any other intervention from a senior male member. The interesting point here is the the discrepancy between the strict code of conduct laid down in terms of marriage and the life of wife and some of the descriptions in the epics in other popular stories and also in inscriptions. While the woman normally has no right to any occupation and therefore she hardly has any scope to earn her livelihood. She is constantly dependent on the members of the family, especially the male members. Yet we come across many women donors in the inscriptions donating in cash or in kind to the Buddhist and Jain monasteries. Obviously they had some resources without which they could not make this act of patronage. What formed the basis of their resources is not known to us, but at least some women had access to resources. This is something very interesting scenario. Though the Indian Shastras very strongly recommends marriage within the same group, inscriptions, ins an inscription from Mathura tells us that marriage took place between the families of an iron monger Lohika Karuka and a jeweler that is Amonikara. So clearly marriages were taking place among different types of families following different types of profession. Women are always lauded as mothers in Indian theoretical treatises and mothers of sons, mothers of daughters rarely enjoyed very high esteem because in typical patriarchal patrilineal society the birth of a son is always preferred to the birth of a daughter. The condition of the widow is generally one of great denial and constant imposition of disabilities. Yet at least Manu was aware of remarried widows Punarbhu, though Manu hardly uh, showed any favorable attitude to the remarried widows. There is one type of woman who does not fall into the category of the daughter or the ideal wife Kulastri, the devoted wife Putivrata. She is the courtesan. By courtesan, 
we do not merely mean the sex worker. The courtesan par excellence is the Ganika. She is a highly accomplished woman. In fact, she is a literate person. She is known for her beauty and charm and has perhaps also some intellectual achievements and also she is ideally a performer of arts of various types. Ganika's figure in our textual sources in a prominent manner and we also find the Ganika as a donor. A classic case comes to us in an inscription from Mathura. In the urban society in Mathura, a Ganika makes donation, quite lavish donation to the Joino monastery and categorically says that she is a Ganika, her mother too was a Ganika. So, she is following the profession of Ganika on a hereditary basis and does not try to suppress this fact. It is possible that the Jaina monastery, the Buddhist establishments were less orthodox and accepted the pious act of donation from the courtesan to the monastery. This is hardly imaginable in the case of orthodox Brahmanical system.